A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, a new dark age has begun, and there is none for whom it is darker than Obi-Wan Kenobi. The Jedi Order to which he has devoted his life has been destroyed. His best friend has been lost to the Sith, and now almost certainly lies dead thanks to the grievous wounds Obi-Wan himself inflicted upon him, and a magnificent woman whom he has known and respected for over a decade has lost the will to live, leaving behind infant twins. Obi-Wan cannot help but feel that he has failed them all. On board the Tant V4, he, Master Yoda, and Bail Organa assemble to discuss the fate of the twins, with Yoda believing they should be split up and hidden to protect them from the Emperor and Anakin if he survived. But here Obi-Wan disagrees with the old master, saying that the children should be his responsibility, since if he had not followed Padme to Mustafar, little Luke and Leia would still have both their parents. Yoda tries to assuage Obi-Wan's guilt here, calling what he did a tragic necessity, and telling him that he is not to blame for young Skywalker's actions. But Obi-Wan will not accept this, since if he had been a better master to Anakin, perhaps none of this would have happened. He then meets both Yoda and Bale's eyes, and in a tone that will brook no argument, tells them that he must set this right. Yoda considers this, then after a moment that seems to span millennia, says that perhaps it truly is the will of the Force that Obi-Wan should train the children to learn from the mistakes of the father, and that unlike last time, he believes Obi-Wan is ready to be their master. He also chuckles that speaking of masters, he has been communing with Qui-Gon Jinn, who has returned from the netherworld of the Force to pass on the secrets of life beyond death. So if Obi-Wan is to undertake this new journey, it will be both one of teaching and learning. Obi-Wan nods his understanding, and so the other two ask him where he will take the twins, with Bale offering them a place in his household on Alderaan. However, Obi-Wan declines, saying that he knows precisely where he can hide them best, Naboo. Bale's brow furrows and he reminds the Jedi that Naboo isn't just Padme's homeworld, it is also Palpatine's, which seems like an unnecessary risk. However, Obi-Wan says that he is well aware of this, and believes it makes Naboo the safest place of all, since Palpatine in his overconfidence would never dream that a Jedi would be bold enough to hide on his own home world. Bale chuckles that it sounds more foolhardy to him, the sort of plan Anakin would come up with, and this mention of his brother's name causes a deep pang in Obi-Wan's soul. But truthfully, he knows that there is another reason he chose Naboo, one based on a lingering fear that Anakin somehow survived his immolation. If he did, Obi-Wan is certain that for as long as he lives, Anakin, or whatever is left of him, will never willingly think of Naboo again, for there is too much pain wrapped up in that world for him. It is the homeworld of his lost love, the place where Master Qui-Gon died, and the last place Anakin was truly free before death and war darkened the galaxy, and that is why it is the safest place for him and the children. With this matter settled, Obi-Wan retrieves little Luke and Leia from the nurse droid, and boards Padme's ship with R2-D2 at his side. Dressed in a royal Naboo security force flight suit to avoid suspicion, the Jedi Master undertakes the sad duty of returning Padme's body to her homeworld, in preparation for her memorial. Even with all the death he has seen over the years, to see Padme like this is harrowing for Obi-Wan, and as the Naboo morticians board the ship to take her away, he makes a silent vow that he will protect her children with his life. As dusk falls, Obi-Wan is among the thousands who line the streets to watch as Padme Amidala, queen, senator, war hero, friend, is laid to rest in her tomb. Here he is not a Jedi Master, but instead just a bystander, something he will have to teach himself to be content with if he is to survive and all he can do is hold the pair of infants tight to his chest, and contemplate how he can do better for them than he could for their parents. The ceremony is one of majesty and solemnity, with several familiar faces heading the procession, including Jar Jar Binks, Boss Nass, and several of Padme's handmaidens from her days as Queen. This at last is a stroke of luck for Obi-Wan, who remembers something Padme once told him about one of her handmaidens, Sabe, that she was the most discreet and trustworthy person in the galaxy, and would do anything for her. In these uncertain times, trustworthy and discreet are two traits worth their weight in Beskar, and so when the crowd goes to disperse, Obi-Wan stays behind, reaching out with the Force to subtly influence the people around Sabe to give her some space so he can talk to her alone. 
It is not a very Jedi-like tactic, but as Obi-Wan has to keep reminding himself, he isn't a Jedi anymore. Finally, the other mourners begin to disperse, and so Sabe turns to leave as well. Obi-Wan falls in step several metres behind her, shadowing her for nearly a block before she takes a turn down a deserted side street. Obi-Wan follows, only to have a blaster barrel planted under his chin. This is evidently a trap, and not for the first time Obi-Wan is shocked by how much the growing of the dark side has clouded his ability to sense imminent danger. In a low voice, cold as carbonite, Sabe orders Obi-Wan to speak or she will drop him like a womp rat. Calmly, the former Jedi Master introduces himself and says that he is also a friend of Padme. Sabe nods that she remembers him now from the invasion and asks if he's here to pay his respects, clear skepticism in her tone as to why it would result in him following her. Obi-Wan shakes his head at this and blithely replies that he actually wanted to introduce her to these two, raising the twins into view and telling Sabe that they are Padme's son and daughter. Sabe calls this ridiculous, citing the clear pregnancy bump on her body, but Obi-Wan gravely tells her that it was a deception designed to keep these two safe, before asking if there is anywhere safe they can talk. For the first time, Sabe smiles, holstering the blaster, and saying she does know one place, though it may be a bit far to walk. The speeder touches down softly on the landing platform of the Lake Country Villa, a fact for which Obi-Wan is immensely grateful, as he had just managed to get Leia to fall asleep. Lifting her and her brother with the force so as not to jostle them, Obi-Wan climbs from the vehicle and is led up a set of ancient steps towards the main house. Sabe tells him that this place is called Varakino, and Padme used to love coming here when she was queen. But through the force, Obi-Wan can feel a much more recent echo of the late senator, and he knows with certainty that this is where Anakin and Padme came while he hunted Fett. This is where they fell in love. Stepping inside, Obi-Wan makes his way to one of the large couches while Sabe stops first at a faucet, splashing water on her face and wiping away the heavy ceremonial makeup. When she turns to him, Obi-Wan can see why Sabe was Padme's primary body double. The resemblance is so uncanny that he could almost swear he is looking at his old friend back from the grave. Sabe then takes a seat across from Obi-Wan and in a firm voice demands that he tell her the whole story. Obi-Wan does exactly that, telling Sabe everything he knows about Anakin and Padme's affair, his fall to the dark side, and the altercation on Mustafar between the three of them. The only omission he makes is that he does not share his fear of Anakin's survival with Sabe, instead stating with certainty that Anakin died on the lava bank. This gives the former handmaiden some small pleasure, as she savagely declares that had Obi-Wan not killed him, she would have. He then recounts the sad events of Polis Massa and Padme's death shortly after naming her twins. He then offers Sabe to hold them, the first time he has let them out of his grasp since taking them into his custody. Sabe accepts, grief and awe battling on her face as she looks at the last living links to her best friend. In a quiet voice, she says that Leia has her mother's eyes, to which Obi-Wan agrees, before bringing the story to close on a hopeful note the promise of a brighter future in these two children. Solemnly, Sabe promises that if she cannot avenge Padme, she will devote the rest of her life to keeping Luke and Leia safe. Obi-Wan thanks her for this offer, saying that they have a long road ahead of them before anyone, least of all these children, can be considered safe. As days turn into weeks, which stretch into months and years, Obi-Wan settles into his new life here in Naboo. Thanks to the newly appointed Moff Panaka living off-world in his garish redwood chalet on the moon of Onoam, Farrakino remains vacant, and a perfect retreat for Obi-Wan and his young charges, just as it was for their parents. At times, he wonders if they can also feel the echoes in the Force Anakin and Padme left on this place, and if so, whether it brings them comfort, or if those presences are strangers to them. But the Force is not the only place Obi-Wan finds traces of his old friends. As he watches their children grow from infants to toddlers to younglings, he sees more of Anakin and Padme and Luke and Leia with each passing day. Luke is a dreamer and an idealist just like his mother, his eyes on the horizon and his head in the clouds, rather literally considering his fondest dream from a young age is to fly. He also proves himself a dab hand with machines early on, terrorizing poor Artu as he constantly attempts to find new excuses to play with his circuitry. Leia, on the other hand, may wear Padme's face, but she is Anakin through and through, passionate, willful, and hot-headed. 
On more than one occasion, her tantrums combined with her raw strength and the force shake the lake house. And Perobion has to wonder if he really survived the horrors of the Clone Wars and the Great Jedi Purge just to die to an upset toddler. But in spite of these minor hiccups, they are a generally harmonious little family, with Luke and Leia adoring their adoptive father, and Obi-Wan loving them as well, despite his worries about their growing attachments to him. From a young age, he instructs them as he and the other younglings at the temple were instructed, helping them to understand the Force and their place in it through daily meditation. Though he has no holocrons for teaching more advanced Jedi practices in history, he is able to recount his own experiences as a Jedi Knight, and in a few cases access recordings from R2's memory banks, which the twins find fascinating. He also gives practical demonstrations of Force abilities, which tend to be Luke's favourite part of training, while Leia is more fond of the rare occasions when Obi-Wan allows the twins to practice with his and Anakin's lightsabers. However, not all his time is spent teaching. As Yoda had said, this time in exile is also the beginning of a new tenure as a student, and so while the kids are asleep or playing, he studies the secrets of the living force with the ghost of Master Qui-Gon. Obi-Wan attempts to pass these lessons on to Luke and Leia as well, but it's still a bit early for metaphysics, and so he continues to prioritise the fundamentals. But even Jedi in training cannot spend all their lives studying, and so slowly but surely, a carefully vetted network of friends and family become common fixtures in the lake house, and in the process become privy to the true fate of Padme Amidala. Sabe is never far, having designated herself the twins' bodyguards just as she was to their mother, and where she goes, her paramour Tonra is never far behind. The pair dote on Luke and Leia constantly, but also care deeply for their safety, and so instruct them in simple self-defense and basic military tactics in case they ever need it. Another common guest is Captain Typho, Padme's previous chief of security and nephew of Moff Panaka. His connections and clearance prove absolutely invaluable, as it is only thanks to him that on the one day Moff Panaka decides to visit Varakino, Obi-Wan and the twins are able to clear out before he arrives. With Typho is often his friend Rick Oli, a former Naboo pilot who Luke idolizes. Though Oli can no longer handle space flight, he is happy to take the boy on little flights below the clouds, teaching him how to fly almost as well as his father. Padme's parents and sister are also brought into the secret, due to Sabe feeling they deserve to know the truth. And though theirs is a modest life, they always bring gifts for the little ones, and often give Obi-Wan small sums of credit so he can provide for himself and his charges. There is one other person who comes to know the secret of Padme and her children, though he is a much less frequent guest due to living and working on Coruscant, that being Jar Jar Binks. Though Sabe and the other friends of Padme are hesitant to trust Jar Jar, considering his history of poor decision-making, Obi-Wan regards the Gungan as an old and trusted friend. Luke and Leia are always delighted when Uncle Jar Jar comes to visit because he is so fun and lively, but having known him for over 15 years now, Obi-Wan can see that Jar Jar has become comparatively withdrawn since the rise of the Empire. He supposes the same could be said of him or anyone else who remembers the old times, but for Jar Jar it is more personal, having given Palpatine the tools he needed to become Emperor. As a result, it does him immense good to know that Padme's children survived, and he quickly becomes just as devoted to their well-being as Sabe or Obi-Wan, enduring great personal risk to act as their spy in the Imperial Senate, watching Palpatine closely. It is through Jar Jar that the group come to learn some truly terrible news. Anakin lives, or rather, Vader does. During one of his visits, Jar Jar tells Obi-Wan and Sabe about the Emperor's new Enforcer, a figure clad in a black mask and armor who goes by the name Darth Vader and seems to possess knowledge of the Force. This chills Obi-Wan, who once more reflects upon his failures. Had he acted more decisively back on Mustafar, this threat to them and the twins never would have arisen. Sabe, on the other hand, bristles, glowering at the Jedi Master and accusing him of lying when he said he killed the man who murdered Padme. Obi-Wan replies that he truly believed Anakin was dead, but that does not excuse this and he humbly apologizes. This does little to quell Sabe's anger, and she declares that she's going to finish the job since Kenobi obviously can't be trusted to do so, before storming out the door. Though Sabe remains nearby to guard the twins, her relationship with Obi-Wan becomes increasingly strained, a fact which the intuitive Luke can't help but notice. One afternoon, while Leia is running saber draws with Obi-Wan, he seeks out his adoptive aunt and asks her why she no longer likes Master Obi-Wan. 
Sabe asks if he sensed that with the Force, but the five-year-old just shakes his head, saying that he could see she was sad, and he doesn't like to see her sad. It is such a Padme thing to say that for a moment Sabe could almost believe she is talking to her old best friend again. But then she remembers that she isn't. She's talking to a child, one she swore to protect, and that sometimes means from the ugliness of the truth. Adopting a motherly smile, she says that she and Obi-Wan just had a fight, and that with time things should get back to normal. Luke asks if Sabe used to get into fights with his mother as well, and Sabe looks a bit wistful, saying they only ever got into one real fight, and that was over a case of mistaken identity. Normally the two of them would fight side by side. She then uses this as a segue to tell him the story of how she and Padme had liberated the Thede Palace from the Trade Federation. Luke always loved stories about his mother and her heroism, though this time he has a question for Sabe that catches her entirely off guard, which in itself is a feat considering Sabe's vigilance bordering on paranoia, as he asks if his father was at the Battle of Naboo. With more brusqueness than she had intended, Sabe snaps that she doesn't remember, in a tone that tells the young boy the conversation is over. However, with the cheekiness only a five-year-old can muster, he smiles back that she's lying, before adding that this time he did sense it with the Force. That smile reminds Sabe of another little boy who had also been gifted in the Force, who had hugged her and Padme after single-handedly disabling a Trade Federation command ship in the wake of the battle. Those memories fill her with nothing but pain now. Pain so palpable that Luke has to take a step back, while Leia comes running in to see what's wrong, her father's blade still glowing in her tiny hand. Taking a deep breath, Sabe tells them that if they have questions about their father, they should direct them to Obi-Wan from now on. But Leia morosely tells her that Master Obi-Wan doesn't like talking about him either. Nonetheless, over dinner, Leia does pluck up the courage to ask her master about Anakin. Sighing deeply, Obi-Wan tells her and her brother what he'd told them every other time the topic of their father had come up. That he was the best star pilot in the galaxy, a cunning warrior, and a good friend. But this time it seems the twins aren't satisfied with that, pressing him to actually tell them about the man he was, the adventures he had, and why he isn't here anymore. Obi-Wan always knew this day would come, and so pushing away from the table, he beckons Luke and Leia to come sit in his lap. When they are comfortable, he tells them a story about a man and a woman who were so deeply in love that they would go to the ends of the galaxy for each other. However, he also tells them of another man, who loved nothing but power and served the dark side of the Force. He was a Sith Lord. The Sith Lord conspired to destroy the couple's happiness, and though Obi-Wan and Anakin tried to stop him, they were not able to, and Anakin fell. By the end of the story, Luke and Leia's eyes are wide and their mouths hang open. Then at once they both begin to speak, Leia proudly declaring they should find the Sith Lord and put an end to his evil once and for all, while Luke declares they should try and find anyone else the Sith Lord has hurt and help them first. Leia shoots back this would just give the Sith Lord time to hurt more people, so they should solve the real problem first. This quickly descends into the siblings bickering, which makes Obi-Wan chuckle, for he tells them that one day they will do both, since when their training is complete, the three of them will bring an end to the Sith Lord's reign of terror together, and this will help everyone, since the galaxy will be free at last. This last part doesn't mean much to the children who have only known the isolated peace of Varakino, but they can see that their master is passionate about it, and so want to help however they can. This ushers in a new era of the twins' training. Now with the purpose to their studies, their dedication doubles, and so with it does their power. Obi-Wan is amazed to see what prodigies these kids are when they actually apply themselves, though he supposes he shouldn't be surprised considering who their father is. By the time the twins would be taking their initiate trials in the old days, they are already adept with Form 3 of lightsaber combat and on their way to learning Form 4. Naturally, both prefer Ataru's more aggressive and athletic style, but Obi-Wan is careful to temper this with more time spent in meditation. Neither Luke nor Leia particularly enjoy this, being far too proactive for such passive activity, and it amuses Obi-Wan to wonder if this trait makes them more like Anakin or Padme. Nonetheless, they both do their best, knowing that it will take more than lightsaber techniques to become a Jedi Knight, and so their control of the Force only grows. However, here Obi-Wan encounters a problem that he had always feared, and that is Leia's natural pull towards darkness. He has always known that Leia is more like her father than her brother is, but as she becomes stronger and stronger with the Force, the similarities between father and daughter become more apparent and it terrifies him. 
Obi-Wan tries to correct this by giving Leia additional lessons in the Force to guide her away from the dark, but this quickly makes Luke jealous, feeling that Obi-Wan likes Leia best, and despite the Jedi Master's claims to the contrary, Luke refuses to believe until Obi-Wan stops with the extra lessons. This in turn makes Leia feel neglected, fueling the very dark urges that Obi-Wan had been trying to quell. Unsure what to do, Obi-Wan turns to Qui-Gon's ghost for guidance, wondering if he has failed them already by allowing the children to form too strong an attachment. But Qui-Gon fondly tells his apprentice that even after all these years, he, like so many other great Jedi, fail to see the truth of the living Force. Obi-Wan asks what he means, and Qui-Gon states that all light casts a shadow, and the brightest lights cast the longest shadows. To claim that a person has no darkness isn't balance, it's denial. So his job as their master isn't to drive out their darkness, it's to guide them so that when the time comes, they will choose to act on their light. Obi-Wan wanly smiles that he is grateful for Qui-Gon's counsel, and still has much to learn, to which the Force Ghost replies that they all do, and the wisest are those who can recognise it. Obi-Wan takes his old master's advice to heart, and so from then on focuses his attention on guiding Luke and Leia rather than a more traditionally prescriptive style of teaching. As self-driven and intelligent children, both take to this well, and he is immensely proud of them for it, though Luke can be a bit argumentative when he feels something shouldn't be a certain way. Such is the danger of raising near teenagers, Obi-Wan supposes, as he reflects on how it has been over a decade since the three of them came to this place. His hair and beard have started to grey in areas, but he is still in his prime, more or less, as seen by his ability to still spar with the kids and join them on their daily obstacle course through the lake country. But with it comes the realisation that he won't always be, and so while he still can, he must prepare them not only to be followers of the light side, but Jedi Knights, guardians of peace and justice, and the first step is getting them their own lightsabers. Sabe is a great help here, though her and Obi-Wan's relationship has never fully healed from the revelation that he failed to finish off the man who caused Padme's death. She is completely devoted to the twins, and so if lightsabers are what they need, she will cross the galaxy to find them. However, this is easier said than done, and though she along with the others are able to scout out most of the parts a Padawan would need to construct their first lightsaber, kyber crystals still elude them. Obi-Wan dares not go to Ilum, having heard from Jar Jar how the Empire has strip-mined it down to the last crystal, and so with nowhere else to turn, authorises his friends to scour the criminal underworld. Thankfully, Tonra and Sabe have a small network of criminal contacts from their time on Tatooine and Coruscant, running shadier off-the-books jobs for Padme. However, even this turns up very little in the way of results, with the few leads often turning into dead ends, or in one case a black sun ambush that Sabe and Tonra have to shoot their way out of. It truly seems as though all hope is lost, until one day the pair return for a mission to the Core Worlds with good news. While talking to a smuggler from Utapau, Sabe had taken the risk of using Obi-Wan's name in the hope that he might feel some gratitude for the Jedi Master liberating his world from General Grievous. And as it turned out, he did. In fact, he felt so grateful that he put them in contact with a man from his organization by the name of Voss, who said that he could show them two kyber crystals easily. Hope swells in Obi-Wan, as he voices his suspicion that this Voss is none other than his old friend Jedi Master Quinlan Voss. Sabe and Tonra say that this guy didn't really seem like the Jedi type, but Obi-Wan assures them that Quinlan never was a very conventional Jedi. This is good enough for them, and so tell Obi-Wan that Voss said to meet them in the Theed Hangar the day after tomorrow if he was interested. On the appointed day, Obi-Wan, Luke, Leia, Sabe, Artu, and Jar Jar head into the city together. Though Obi-Wan believes that this will be a meeting of old friends, he still doesn't want to take any chances, and so has Jar Jar watch the kids and enjoy the entertainment of the city for a day while he and Sabe meet with Voss. The duo arrive at the agreed-upon time, and Obi-Wan is disappointed to see that their contact is not a Kifar Jedi, but instead a pale humanoid with vertical lines running along his face. He introduces himself as Dryden Voss, and asks if Obi-Wan is Master Kenobi. Obi-Wan confirms this, hoping this meeting can still at least yield the intended result, and so asks Voss if he has the two lightsaber crystals. Voss smiles blithely that he doesn't, but his associate does. Just then, the double doors of the hangar part to reveal a leering Zabrak face, who utters a single word. Kenobi. <laughs> <laughs> 